reading from the Philokalia, volume 3, page 93. The writer is St. Peter of Damascus, and the subject is the Seven Commandments, which is the first seven Beatitudes. If we want to make a start, we must concentrate on the practice of these seven forms of bodily discipline and on nothing else. Otherwise, we will fall over a precipice, or rather into chaos. In the case, both of the seven gifts of the Spirit and the Lord's Beatitudes, we are taught that if we do not begin with fear, we can never ascend to the rest. For as David says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Another inspired prophet describes the seven gifts as the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and reverence, the spirit of the fear of God. Our Lord himself began his teaching by speaking of fear, for he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, that is, those who quail with fear of God and are inexpressibly contrite in soul. For the Lord has established this as the basic commandment, knowing that without this even living in heaven would be profitless. For one would still possess the same madness through which the devil, Adam, and many others have fallen. If then we wish to keep the first commandment, that is, to possess, to possess the fear of the Lord, we should meditate deep, deeply upon the contingencies of life already described and upon God's measureless and unfathomable blessings. We should consider how much he has done and continues to do for our sake through things visible and invisible, through commandments and dogmas, threats and promises, how he guards, nourishes, and provides for us, giving us life and saving us from the enemy seen and unseen, how through the prayers and intercessions of his saints he cures the diseases caused by our own disarray, how he is always long-suffering over our sins, our irreverence, our delinquency, over all those things that we have done, are doing and will do, from which his grace has saved us, how he is patient over our actions, words, and thoughts that have provoked his anger, and how he not only suffers us, but up even to bestows greater blessings on us, acting directly or through the angels, the scriptures, through righteous men and prophets, apostles, martyrs, teachers, and holy fathers. Moreover, we sh should not only recall the sufferings and struggles of the saints and martyrs, but should also reflect with wonder on the self-abasement of our Lord Jesus Christ, the way he lived in the world, his pure passion, cross, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the advent of the Holy Spirit, the indescribable miracles that are always occurring every day, paradise, the crowns of glory, the adoption to sonship that he has escorted us, and all the things contained in holy scriptures, and so much else. If we bring all this to mind, we will be amazed at God's compassion. With trembling, we'll marvel at his forbearance and patience. We will grieve because of what our nature has lost, angel-like dispassion, paradise, and all the blessings which have, which we have forfeited, and because of the evils unto which we have fallen, demons, passions, and sins. In this way, our soul will be filled with contrition, thinking of all the ills that have been caused by our wickedness and the trickery of the demons. So it is that God grants us the blessing of inward grief, which constitutes the second commandment. For as Christ says, blessed are those who grieve, who grieve for themselves and also out of love and compassion for others as well. We become as one who mourns a dead person because we perceive the terrible consequences that the things we have done before our death 
will have for us after we are dead. And we weep bitterly from the depths of our heart and with inexpressible sorrow, worldly honor or dishonor, no longer concerns us. We become indifferent to life itself, often forgetting even to eat because of the pain in our heart and our ceaseless lamentation. In this way, God's grace, our universal mother, will give us gentleness so that we begin to imitate Christ. This constitutes the third commandment, for the Lord said, Blessed are the gentle. Thus we become like a firmly rooted rock, unshaken by the storms and tempests of life, always the same, whether rich or poor, in ease or hardship, in honor or dishonor, in short, at every moment, and whatever we do, we will be aware that all things, whether sweet or bitter, pass away, and that this life is a path leading to the future life. We will recognize that whether we like it or not, what, what happens, happens. To be upset about this is useless and moreover deprives us of the crown of patience and shows us to be in revolt against the will of God. For whatever God does is holy, good, and beautiful, even if we are unaware of this. As the psalm puts it, he will teach the gentle how to judge, or rather how to exercise discrimination. Then even if someone gets furious with us, we are not troubled. On the contrary, we are glad to have been given an opportunity to profit and to exercise our understanding, recognizing that we would not have been tried in this way were there not some cause for it, unwittingly or wittingly, we must have offended God, or brother, or someone else. But now we are being given a chance to receive forgiveness for this. For through patient endurance, we may be granted forgiveness for many sins. Moreover, if we do not forgive others their debts, the Father will not forgive us our debts. Indeed, nothing leads more swiftly to the forgiveness of sins than the virtue or commandment, forgive, and you will be forgiven.